Today's video, we're going to take a look at answering the big question. What is calculus? And really, calculus is going to be the answer to three questions. The first question that we're going to attempt to answer and we're going to focus on here in chapter 2 is, what is it getting close to? And this, in calculus, we're going to affectionately call the limit. The second question we're going to attempt to answer, and it's really the focus of chapter 3, is what is the slope? Specifically, what is the slope at this given point? And there, we're going to call that in calculus the derivative. The third question we're going to attempt to answer is, what is the area? And we're not going to really dive into that question until we get to Calc 2 next term. But for now, I'll just tell you that that is the integral of the function. So to kind of set this up, um, we're going to take a look at, first, the tangent problem. For the tangent problem, I want to first consider how fast These lines are changing. And we really call that our rate of change. So I'm going to put three graphs up here. First graph is going to be y equals 2 thirds x minus 1. And this graph will have a y-intercept at negative 1. And it'll rise 2 and run 3 to another point. So it's going to look something like that. The second graph we're going to look at is y equals negative 3x plus 2. And so that graph has a y-intercept at 2, and it slopes down 3 over 1. And it looks like this guy. And the third graph we're going to look at is y equals negative 1. And that's just a flat line right at negative 1. And the question here that we're considering is, how fast are these lines changing? How are these lines changing? The first graph here, the 2 thirds x minus 1, we see it is going uphill from left to right, but it's going uphill slowly. It's kind of gradually working its way uphill, which is different than the second graph, because not only is it going downhill, but it's also going down much quicker. It's going downhill quickly. And that's going to be different than this third graph, which really isn't going up or down. It's kind of flatlined. So we'll say this is a flat or no change. Now, what's interesting here is these lines are really easy to see how the graph is changing, because they're just a straight line. They're always changing at the same rate, 
A is always going up slowly, B is always going down quickly, and C is always flat without any change. But this is not always the case. Actually, most functions do not have a constant rate of change. For example, if we consider the graph y equals x squared plus 2. Now, y equals x squared plus 2 has a vertex rate at 2. It's got the point at 1, 3, and negative 1, 3, and then uh, 6 and negative 6. Or I'm sorry, 3, 6, and 3, negative, negative 3, 6. So here is the graph of x squared plus 2. Now, if we consider uh, at the point 0, where x is equal to 0, if I were to look at that graph, it's kind of leveled out there at the bottom. We could draw a line that's tangent to that point. And right now, it has a slope of 0. It's really not changing at that point. It's not going up or down. It's kind of leveled out at the bottom. That's a little different than if I consider the point that's just 1 to the right. Because at that point, it's actually got a much steeper tangent line that could be drawn that barely touches it. And there, the slope of that graph, it's going uphill. It's actually rising 2 and running 1. If I could grab a different color, we could look at this point at negative 1 or negative 2. Looking at the point at negative 2, we see it's very, very, very steep. In fact, the slope there is going to be negative 4. And we'll talk later about how we can actually calculate those exact slopes. But what's interesting here is this graph starts out with a very steep negative slope, and then it levels out and turns into a positive slope, which gets steeper and steeper. I've already hinted at this, but uh, the lines that touch the graph are what we're going to call tangent lines, where they touch the graph in one point and then go off into the distance. So the question we're going to attempt to find out is, what is the slope of these tangent lines? To do that, we're going to set up another thing called the secant line. We can actually approximate the rate of change or tangent line. with what we're going to call a secant line. Here's what we mean by that. So we've got some graph here. We're going to say it comes in, goes up, and levels off. And right here, we're going to say is A, which means if we go up, this point here is going to be at f of a. And then a little bit over from a is b. And if we go up from b, that point right there will be at f of b. If we connect a and b with a line,
That is called a secant line. A secant line is going to go through two points on the line. In fact, we know what those two points are. Let's go ahead and label those in brown. The x-coordinate of this first point is a, and the y-coordinate is f of a. And the second one with b, the x-coordinate is b, and the y-coordinate is f of b. And if we wanted to calculate the slope, which we always use m for slope, of the secant line, we know it's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So that would be f of b minus f of a over the b minus the a. This is going to be an important formula for us, the formula for the slope of the secant line. And what's interesting about this is as a and b get closer and closer together, let's draw another graph. As a and b get close, See if I can draw that same graph on here, approximately. And if we keep a at about the same spot, and so f of a is still at the same spot. But if we put b right next to it, notice it's closer now for f of b. The secant line that connects them is starting to look like a tangent line that only touches in one spot. In other words, as a and b get closer together, we get closer to the tangent line. This is the big idea that we're going to go after today is can we get a and b close enough together so that we can estimate what is the tangent line? Let's try it, though, with some numbers in there to make things a little clearer. So let's do number four. We're going to do an example here. We're going to estimate. the slope and equation, while we're at it, of the tangent line to the function f of x equals 2x squared minus 3 at the point 2 comma 5. Now, the idea here is we want to estimate what it is using a different x and y point, where we're going to try and get closer and closer and closer to our actual point of 2. So we know at 2, the y coordinate's 5. So we'll start kind of close to 2. Maybe we'll start at 2.1. Then we'll get a little closer, 2.01. Then we'll get a little closer, 2.001. And then finally, a little bit closer, 2.0001. And we're going to see what y equals at each of these points. We know at 2, it's going to hit 5. But what's it going to hit as we get close to 2, as we pull b closer and closer to our a? Fortunately, this is going to be really easy to do on our calculators. So if we turn our calculators on and hit the y equals button, we can type in our function in y equals. And our function is 2x squared minus 3. Then what we're going to do is if we hit the second button, and then right above graph, we see in blue it says table. And we should be able to delete these values out of here. If you cannot delete the values out of your table, first hit second, and then above window, you see it says table set. 
And we're going to change the independent variable, the x, to ask so that we can pick what we want that x to be equal to. Now go back to second table. And now we can enter in our values we want for x. The first value we want is 2.1. The second value is 2.01. The third value is 2.001. And the third value is 2.001. And we start to see we get these values for y. Let's record them in our y column here. That's 5.82. The next one was 5.0802. The next one was 5.008. And then finally, it was 5.0008. So now what we really end up with is a third column. Let me label it in black here. x comma y is going to be our third column. These are going to be our points that we're going to compare to the original point of 2, 5. So x comma y is 2.1 comma 5.82. Then we had 2.01 comma 5.0802. Then we had 2.001 comma 5.008. And then finally, 2.0001, 5.0008. We're going to use these points and the original point, the 2, 5, to calculate a whole bunch of slopes of the secant line. And again, we're going to use the calculator to help us out with that to make some of these calculations easier. If we hit second quit, it'll take us back to the home screen. Quit is right above the mode button. And then we're just going to type in our slope formula where the numerator and denominator need to be in parentheses. So the y2 we calculated from the first point was 5.82 minus the y1 was 5, because we always go back to the original point, divided by the x1 from the point we found, the 2.1, whoops, need to put it in parentheses, 2.1 minus the 2, close the parentheses. And when we hit Enter, we find our slope right now is 8.2. So let's go ahead and record that. Our slope right now is 8.2. But then we're going to move a little bit closer. Now we're going to use our second point, which is the 2.01 comma 5.0802. Again, y2 minus y1, so 5.0802 minus the y from our original point of 5 divided by the 2.01 minus the 2. Again, remember numerator and denominator in parentheses. And now we have a slope of 8.02. Let's try our third point. Our third point was 5.008 minus the 5 divided by the 2.001 minus the 2. And now we're going to get this nice, pretty 8. Our slope right now is 8. In fact, when we do it again for the third point, we're going to get the exact same thing because we are so close. The difference is going to be minuscule. 5.0008 minus the 5 divided by the 2.0001 minus the 2. And again, we get 8 for the slope. So we can use this fact to estimate the slope of the tangent line now. We see the slope of the secant line is getting closer and closer to 8.0. So the slope of the tangent line is probably that 8.0 that we're getting closer and closer to. So if it is 8.0, then we're ready to actually calculate the equation at that point. And going back to our algebra days, a good equation to remember that the equation of the line is equal to y equals m times x minus x1 plus y1, where x1 and y1 are a point we know that's on the line. 
and m is the slope. This is a good equation to commit to memory because we are going to use this equation a lot in this course. So for our purposes, we've got y equals m. The slope of the tangent line we just found out was 8 times x minus x1. Going back to our original point, the x coordinate was 2 plus the y coordinate of 5. The equation of our tangent line to 2x squared minus 3 at 2, 5 is this guy, y equals 8 times x minus 2 plus 5. We can use this concept in physics to look at what's called the average velocity and the instantaneous velocity. Velocity is really talking about speed. So if we're talking about the average velocity or the average speed, Speed doesn't really have direction, and velocity does have direction. It's only real different. The average velocity of an object can be found by the velocity average is equal to the function at the first point, at the initial point of time minus the function at the final point in time all over the difference in the times. And really, you'll notice that this equation, while I mark it as an important equation that we need to know for our course, it really is the same equation as the secant that we've already worked with. And then, if that's the average velocity over an amount of time, we can find the instantaneous velocity. or how fast the object is moving at a specific point in time instead of an average over a range, it is found by making t2 closer to t1. In other words, the same idea we did before. If we try closer and closer and closer numbers, we'll get closer and closer to the actual instantaneous velocity, which is the slope of a tangent line. So let's try an example problem where we can see that actually done. Let's see an object is dropped. from the top of a 144-foot cliff. And it will land three seconds later We can actually find the function for its height. Its height is given by the function f of x equals negative. Actually, let's not do f of x. Let's make it more descriptive. We're doing height. So let's say height of t, or height of time, is equal to negative 16t squared plus 144. We're going to find the average velocity between 2 seconds and 2.01 seconds and between 1.99 seconds 
and 2 seconds. So the average velocity just after 2 seconds and the average velocity just before 2 seconds and see what we can learn about that. So first for the first point, I'll do this first point in blue. Uh, the average velocity, we need to know what the height is at those two points. So we'll say h of 2. And I'm just going to plug this into our calculator. Negative 16 times 2 squared plus 144. When I do that on the calculator, we get 80. So the height at 2 is 80. And the height just afterwards at 2.01. Again, if I plug that into my calculator, negative 16 times 2.01 squared plus 144. That's going to equal 79.3584. 79.35. Let's just round it to 8. So the average velocity, then, is going to be the slope between these two points. So the average velocity is equal to y2, which is 80, minus y1, 79.358, over the difference in the x's, 2 minus 2.01. The average velocity here is negative 64.2 feet per second. So just after 2 seconds, the object is moving at 64.2 feet per second. It's negative because it's going down. Let's see what's happening just before. We'll do this in green off to the right here so we can keep these separate. So we need to know what the height is at 1.99 and what the height is at 2. Fortunately, we already calculated the height at 2. That's 80. If we put the 1.99 in our calculator, we'll end up with approximately 80.638. So to find the average velocity here, we'll take the subtract the y's divided by subtracting the x's. So 80.638 minus 80 divided by 1.99 minus 2. And when we do this, we find out the average velocity just before 2 seconds is negative 63.8 feet per second. And what you'll notice is both of these are really close, 0.2 away of each side of the negative 64. So we can actually find out or estimate the instantaneous velocity to be somewhere in the middle of these two guys. So between 64.2 and 63.8, it's probably at two seconds, at that exact moment in time, moving approximately negative 64 feet per second. That would be the tangent line or the instantaneous velocity. So with this preview so far, we've answered really the first two questions. We've been looking at what is the slope or the tangent and then also, what is that secant line getting close to? Let's take a look at a little preview of the third question of calculus. We won't spend much time on this because it's really a second quarter calculus question. But the question is, what is the area? Here's what that looks like in calculus. Going back to part C, addressing the area problem. We are going to consider, actually, let's make this number one. Consider the area under y equals x minus 3 squared plus 1 between the x values of 0 to 3. 
We're going to need a really tall graph for this, but that shouldn't be too bad. we got plenty of space here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So we know x squared is the parabola shape. The minus 3 moves it to the right 3. The plus 1 moves it up 1. So the graph is going to look something like this. And it wants the area between 0 and 3. So between 0 and 3, what we're really doing is saying, what is the area that fills in underneath the graph? What we want is the area shaded in green here, is how much area is underneath the graph. So we can estimate it. And the way we're going to estimate it is we're going to say, hey, it's really easy to find the area of a rectangle. So we can use rectangles where the right corner of the rectangle actually touches the graph that we're talking about. So let me see if I can recreate the graph here. It's at 9, um, 3, 1. Is that right? It's at 10. So here's our graph, roughly drawn. And what we're going to do is we're going to take each point and make it into a rectangle where the right corner of the rectangle touches the graph. So each rectangle is one wide. And the first rectangle is one high. The second rectangle you see is two high. And the third rectangle, I think it's five high. Yeah, it's 5 high. So we could say that the area under here is 5 plus 2 plus 1, or the area is approximately 8 when we use rectangles on the right side, where the right corner hits the graph. But we could also do it the other way, because the problem here is we end up a little bit short. Let's use uh, just some gray space for the short. Notice we miss this gray triangle and another gray triangle and another gray triangle. We're short because we went to the right. So to avoid being short, we could draw rectangles that the left corner touches the graph and see how that compares. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Putting our key points on here of 3, 1. Move over 1 and up 1. Over 1 and up 1, 2, 3. And then finally the 9. So if I wanted to draw rectangles where the right corner or the left corner touch the graph, we would start at the top point and say, OK, come out from the left corner, and there is my first rectangle. Then come out from the left corner, go over one unit, and there's your next. And come out from the left, and there's our next rectangle. And so we end up with three rectangles again. And we can find the area of those rectangles. The first rectangle on the left has a height of 10. Actually, let's put, whoops, let's put, uh, ah, wrong color. Let's 
put the heights on the right here. A height of 10, the second rectangle is a height of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the third rectangle has a height of 2. So when we add those together, the area that we end up with is going to be uh, 10 plus 5 plus 2. The area comes out to be approximately 17. But again, we've got a problem. Because now instead of having too little area, we end up with too much area. We've kind of got this area that I'm going to color in in gray that sticks up above the graph. So the first time we were too low, the second time we're too high. How are we going to estimate what the actual value is? Well, we could estimate, since we're just estimating, the actual area is in the middle of these two values. So we could just average the 8 and 17. 8 plus 17 divided by 2, when we do that, we get a 12.5. So we're going to say our final estimate is that the area underneath y equals x minus 3 squared plus 1 between 0 and 3, we're going to estimate that it's about 12.5. Well, as you might expect, this process is not perfect because actually, the actual area is 12 exactly. So we got an extra 0.5 out of it. But that's not a bad estimate for just kind of drawing rectangles and estimating and making a guess at it. Now, in Calc 2, we'll talk about uh, some methods to find that exact area of 12. But for now, I just want to kind of expose you. This, is, this whole lesson today is just a preview of calculus. Just expose you to the idea of the three questions that we're going to be addressing in calculus. What is it getting close to? We call that a limit. We're going to focus on that in Chapter 2. What is the slope? We call that the derivative, and we'll focus on finding that in Chapter 3. And then finally, what is the area? We call that the integral, and we're going to find that in Calc 2. So I hope you enjoyed this preview of calculus. Take a look at the practice problems in the book, and I'll look forward to seeing you in class.